I just have to copy the link from here before I sit back in my seat. I don't have it. Oh no, Oh yeah, it's No, no, Okay. okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second session of our Micro Habitable Planet, the Habitable Planet workshop in one day. If you remember back all the way to this morning, you'll remember that I gave the talk in the beginning. I did, honestly, where um, we learned about the Big Bang and why we have something not nothing. And I showed you that we've now discovered NASA and humanity now know of tens of thousands of planets in the universe. But only one of them is known to be habitable, the one we're on now. And so we posed the question, why is that? How can we explain why that's habitable? And in the first talk of the morning, entitled Not Too Hot, we first looked at the point, well, Mars is too cold and Venus is too hot. Maybe Earth is the only habitable planet because it happens to be the right distance from the sun. And we learned some high school physics, albedo, conservation of energy. We put those together to calculate what the temperature of the Earth should be in a really simple model. And in our simple model, the Earth and the other planets are just balls of rock at a given distance from the sun, right? And we found out that far from um, that re reproducing reality that Venus is hot, Earth is right, and Mars is cold, all of the planets in our simple model were far too cold, including Earth. Earth should be minus 20. But that was good because it taught us something. We know that something from our idealized model is, is missing. It couldn't be just the difference from the sun that makes Earth this one habitable planet, the one, the only one we know of, tens of thousands to be habitable. So then we went on and we started adding layers of complexity to our model. Something else, an atmosphere was missing, right? And we saw that because Venus is bigger, it has more of an atmosphere. Because Mars is smaller, it has less of an atmosphere. And that means that Venus has a big insulating atmosphere and gets far too hot. Mars has no insulating atmosphere and is far too cold. Earth has just the right amount to keep it at the right temperature. But if we just had a static atmosphere, we discovered the Earth would be far too hot. We need the atmosphere to move. And in the last talk, we saw that the atmosphere circulates in this three-cell model, a one-cell model, which you'd expect as a result of the Coriolis force. So you would expect that heat at the equator would make uh, air rise, fall at the poles and come back. But because the Earth is rotating, it gets disrupted. We don't just have north-south, we have east-west winds that we saw, and we don't just have one cell, but three. And so we have winds, and this takes heat from the equator to the pole and cools the planet down. But the atmosphere itself is not enough. We're going to have to add something more to our model to understand even just why we get the right temperatures. We're going to do that in this session. Firstly, I'd like to hand over to Ophelia, who will chair the session today. Thank you, Ophelia. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'll be a presenter for this round. Please call me Madam Chair. All right. <laughs> so right now, so we're giving time to um, yeah, we, we were just hearing about the circulating of the atmosphere. Now, when I hear about the circulating of the oceans, so over to you, Belinda. Hi guys. Hi guys. How are you? Well, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I'm Belinda Mignola. I'm going to be doing my master's in oceanography at UCT. So today I'm going to be telling you about circulating oceans. Okay, so this is my outline first. I'm going to introduce you for the ocean and from there I'm going to explain what really is ocean circulation and I'm going to be focusing on the three key points. Firstly, I'm going to be focusing on wind driven circulation and I'm, I'm going to focus on thermohaline circulation and then from there I'm going to be explaining the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere and then from there I'm going to be summarizing. Okay, so Ntengi and Didi, they were telling you about circulating atmosphere, right? 
So what did you learn about circulating atmosphere? What is the key point about circulating atmosphere? Oceans and air. Okay. And okay. The main point that I got from circulating atmosphere is uh, uh, circulating atmosphere is driven by uh, an equal solar heating, right? And a uh, circulating atmosphere maintains uh, the air by uh, transporting heat, right? Okay, so yeah, now let's go to the ocean. So yes, you know, the, what's the ocean? And it, it covers the third quarter of, of the Earth's surface. And then why should we worry about ocean? Why should we, we be concerned? So you guys know Charles Darwin, right? So Charles Darwin, when he was at the point, when he was cruising on the voyage of the Beagle, uh, okay, uh, the special point if he passed around Cape Town, so like that's what you know makes special that Charles Darwin passed there. And when he was passing, there, he went to <laughs> he went to uh, uh, the Atlantic, uh, I mean, to the North Atlantic Ocean, and then he found out that at the Galapagos Island, the the he found out that the water there is cold, right? So we know that there is along the equator, right? And you know that at the equator is hot. So why is the water cold there? Okay, cool. So the second trigger here uh, shows us the, the meridional section of the temperature along the ocean. So as you can see, uh, the, the ocean surface, it has like a, a thin layer of warm water, right? So why does it have a thin layer of warm water? So uh, the key point about the ocean, uh, as we know, the, the atmosphere is heated from below, right? And when it's heated from below, it, it uh, influences what? Vertical motion. But however, with the, with the ocean, ocean is heated from above. And then we know that the, the specific, uh, the, the, yeah, the ocean, it, it takes time to, to heat, right? The specific heat of the ocean is greater, so it takes time to warm and cool, so that's why it, it is like highly certified, right? So now I'm going to be explaining why is it cold and how is it how how the water in the equator is cold while we think it should be warm. Okay, so ocean circulation. What is ocean circulation? So ocean circulation is the net of all forces acting on the ocean on various scales. However, the oceanographers choose to explain it in two forms, right? So we have the wind driven circulation and the highland circulation. And looking at the wind driven circulation, so here is our wind driven circulation, right? Around the, across the ocean. So uh, first of all, I'm, I'm gonna show you this uh, picture and I'm gonna explain why is it like this, right? So you can see at the northern hemisphere, we have a uh, gyrus, right? And then they will take to clockwise, right? And then the southern hemisphere, we have what? Jazz and then they rotate anti clockwise. So I'm going to be explaining why is it like that. Okay, so Vidi and Tengi, they explained uh, to you uh, the concept of current force, right? So we know why it is it deflecting to the, left, to the left in the southern hemisphere and why is it deflecting to the right in the northern hemisphere. So again, this man called uh, Mr. Mr. Nansen. He was cruising uh, at the Arctic Sea, right? So while he was cruising, he found out that the, the ice were, drifting, were not drifting parallel to the prevailing wind, but however, it was uh, drifting to the right of it. Can anyone tell me why? The Coronis effect. Okay, so uh, why should we be concerned about uh, this uh, Ekman spell? Ekman spell has helped us to understand wind-driven ocean Secretion. So, what really happens during atmosphere? So, um, you can assume that the ocean surface is made is made up of uh, uh, deep columns of no deep uh, layers of water column, right? And then let's uh, okay, we assume that there's a wind at the ocean surface. So, when there's a, a prevailing wind at the ocean surface, uh, okay, for for this uh, diagram, we're in the northern hemisphere. So, there's wind at the ocean surface. So, the wind. Uh, and it goes over the surface, it transfers kinetic energy into these uh, deep, uh, deep, 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 deep layers, right? So when it transfers 
uh, it transfers the energy through friction. And then uh, as we go down through the, 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 the water column, through the layers, the, the, the heat is lost, right? So, and then it came to a point where there is no, like it, it deflects and deflects while the, 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 the speed of the current decreases and then it came to a point where it stops, right? So why is this important? So we know that like uh, uh, this Edmund spiral has helped us to, you know, uh, the, the spiraling of, of the current, right? It, uh, and the decreasing of the speed. It, it helps to maintain the, the circulating current. And then like, yeah, there is one of the current that I showed you before that. And then like, you see that the trade winds are along the painter and then uh, the, the, not the, the eastern way, but the current they are deflected to the left. And then the other side, we have the current that they study. They also deflected to it. And then the, the continents, they also have to deflect the current to the right of the grid. And then it forms a circular pattern that drives it into circulation. Okay, so now I'm gonna explain to you why or what is the importance of wind driven situation. So have you heard of a boiling? What's a boiling? So okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Then I'm going to explain what's a uh, upwelling. So we have four types of upwelling. We have a symmetrical upwelling where it's, uh, it occurs at the point code. We have a uh, asymmetrical it occurs at the equator, and we have a uh, signal that happens at the line code. We have a uh, one hundred even hundred current. Our local example is a center and I'm going here. You can see that this is like at this figure. We have red color there. The red color shows the uh, upwelling, which is like cold water. And we have a uh, regular upwelling at the southern portion. So, what really happens to the upwelling? So, we go back to Ekman, Ekman transport, Ekman theory. So, uh, we have a prevailing wind at the ocean surface, right? And depending on the hemisphere you're at, so we just picture we're at the southern hemisphere. So, uh, we have a prevailing wind, and the wind, when the wind is trailing on the ocean, it will deflect to the left, right? So, when it deflects to the left, the warm water piles. To that side, and then the cold water absorbs from the water and it occupies the, the space, right? So it's a uh, is there, and uh, the cold water comes to the surface, and then the warm water is passed to the, to the side, right? And then, okay, why is this important? So, as the creature here, you can see that the, the surface wind is, is going to the west, right? And then the same is here, and then the surface wind is going to the west, and then it's bringing to the right, to the left, and then the same is here. So, and then when the water at the equator, because I said that it ties the warm water to the side and then it brings up the cold water. Right? So the warm water of the, uh, of the, and the equator, it goes to the poles, right? And then the cold water comes from the poles and then it occupies the space. So this maintains the, the transport of, of water, or more, or warm water to the poles and cold water to the equator. So another importance of upgrading is on balance. So when the cold water up water comes to the surface, it, it brings nutrients, right? And then we add the surface with the euphotic zone, right? So euphotic zone is the zone at the ocean surface where the sunlight penetrates, right? So we know that uh, in order for photosynthesis to happen, uh, it needs sunlight. So through this process, uh, the area becomes you know, rich in nutrients and then it maintains the food webs and also it maintains the fishing industries. And then a point in my thing, like uh, you can see that. Yeah, this picture is Cape Town, right? And then this picture is Leverage. So, what's the difference? Yeah. Cape Town people are outside the water, and this side, yeah. why is it like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ocean <laughs> circulation, right? So, yeah, the upwelling is like it maintains, like it, it explains why it's it's called Cape because the water falls this side and then. And water current, and then here yeah, the water has not boiled, it's warm, there's no water in the side, and then it's, it's hot, and people can enjoy the beach. So, and then the because I explained the cold energy at the Benguela and the warm and then Atlas current, right? So, they help to maintain 
uh, you can find out that Zulu also is a question for this side, it's called, and this one, they find out that it's like, it, it creates difference in ecosystem at, the, you know, different, like the East Coast and the West Coast, though we, they are at the same latitude, right? So this might have lower sea surface temperature. So when the sea surface temperature is lower, what happens? The evaporation rate is, is lower, and then it, it leads to less convection, less convection, less rainfall. So that it explains why this place is dry. So at this side, we have higher, <laughs> higher surface temperature. So when we have high surface temperature, what happens? High evaporation rates, higher evaporation rates, more convection, more convection, more, more rainfall. Okay, yeah. So <clears throat> we are done with the wind reverse equation. So now I'm going to be focused on the thermal, the thermal highland circulation. So the highland circulation, it's, it circulates the water around the ocean and it's often called uh, Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. Why is it called Great Ocean Conveyor Belt? It's called Great Ocean Conveyor Belt because it transports large volume of water to the Pacific, the Indian, and the Atlantic Ocean line. So on the diagram, you can see that North Atlantic and Southern Ocean, they have high salinity, and then when they have high salinity, they are the major secure regions of the submarines that go about the higher situation. So like you can see, the cold water, it, it comes from the Norwegian Sea, comes down to Southern Ocean, and it goes to the Pacific. So when it's at the Pacific, it warms, become less dense, and it rises, and then it loses cold and goes back to the Norwegian Sea, and then it maintains the cycle, right? So how does this happen? Okay, uh, this is the Driven Ocean, which is called the highest equation, is driven by differences in salinity and temperature. So it's thermal, it's temperature, and then saline is salinity. So then again, did you explaining the transport of heat to the equator and to the pole side? So this side, at the equator is hot, so the warm water comes less dense and it rises, and at the pole, it's cold, more, de more, more dense, and it sticks, so it maintains a cycle. So we know that at the subtropical region, there, there's more evaporation. So when there's more evaporation, there's increase in salinity, and then as it falls, there's more precipitation than, uh, than, than evaporation. So the difference in salinity influences the ocean circulation. So why is it important? It is important because it maintains the salinity of the ocean, and it helps to redistribute heat and in the ocean. So <clears throat> now I'm going to be talking about the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. As Vivian Plank, you have told you that, you know, they dance together, right? Okay, so have you heard about El Nino or Enzo? What happens to El, El Nino? What's El Nino? Okay, he says, he says that there's trout in South Africa, right? So El Nino is a natural occurring phenomenon in the equatorial Pacific, right? that involves the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere, right? And which leads to fluctuating global temperatures. So the, the, first, uh, the first diagram is El Nino. So during El Nino, there is warmer sea surface temperature anomalies, right? Not warmer sea surface temperature anomalies. And then during La Nina, there are more colder sea surface temperature anomalies, right? So the, the next, Diagram explains uh, the difference between a uh, normal year, a uh, Nino year, and La Nina year. So during normal year, this, the trade winds move from east to west, right? And when it moves to the, the smaller, uh, uh, they, they transport warm water from east to west. And when they transfer the warm water to east to west, the cold water abounds at the east side, and then the warm water and the west side uh, takes a precipitation. However, during a Nino, the the jet wind reverses right and then the thermal highland uh, deepens and when the highland deepens there's no upwelling right and during La Nina La Nina is like enhanced you know process is like okay it's normal it's the same as normal year but there's more precipitation or more or it's going to more at least. so like yeah so yeah we have heard that and uh, we 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 are experiencing uh, and you know now, I mean, I mean, we're experiencing drought now in South Africa, right? And we know that it's an El Nino year. So 
It's when we have uh, higher uh, higher rainfall anomalies, which which means it's more I mean more floods. And then during El Nino, which is the red part, it's it's uh, it's uh, lower uh, precipitation anomalies. So here's the uh, Southern Africa. Uh, this was Southern Africa during El Nino, yeah? and you can see that uh, our north is uh, South Africa and North West, no, 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 West and Free State and KZN. There is more more clouds, but around the big there's more more floods. So and you know it it affects the food security and the economy of South Africa. So that's why you need to understand it and know how to to, to predict it. So uh in summary, what did you learn? How does uh wind circulation how does wind circulation uh maintains uh, or keeps the air uh, habitable? So we learn through with the wind circulation that it, it transports cold water to there. Post and warm water to there. I mean, warm water to the post and cold, cold water to the to the to the, the pool. I mean, to the sorry, warm water to the post and cold water to the equator, right? And we have learned that the presence of sedimentation maintains moist uh, turbine and I mean moist Maputo and drier Namibia. We have also learned that through uh, avoiding the webs are are maintained. And then they are sustained fishing industry. And then we learned that through the higher circulation, there's distribution of heat, right? And salt in the ocean. And then it keeps the ocean more salty, right? And then uh spare and appear war, because we explain that uh, ocean and atmosphere, they're all related and they maintain climate and weather. They'll, they'll tell you what happened before uh, before now and what how can we predict better as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was very wonderful. What are you guys saying? Does anybody have something to say? Yes, Megan. Uh, Shota. Okay, Sarah. Yeah, still have feedback. Yeah, feedback. Um, you, you go extremely fast, 
you basically give you pause and you come down again and you need to give you pause and so three come down this really really thank you You know what I'm going to say? No, I'm going to ask you all this question. And then just say, no, 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 The only comment that I might have is that I think might have when you turn away, you press that with a slide that shows where it was, and then you start what it was. But you can see those slides, and then start explaining what it is, and then explain the initial way it was, because that slide is not really helpful. It's not meaningful before you know why are we doing the same thing. But other than that, all right, thanks, Belinda. Thank you, Belinda. That's a wonderful presentation. Origins of life, can you come up? <laughs> okay, now it's called. <laughs> okay, so then, thank you very much. Linda, we've now learned about a really interesting physical picture of how the Earth works, right? So we've gone from the observation that Earth is the only habitable planet, is it the right distance from the sun? That's not the only thing. We needed an atmosphere and now and, and greenhouse effect, and we learned about how that keeps the planet warm. And now we've added atmospheric circulation to take heat from the equator to the poles, and ocean circulation, and learn how that also distributes heat. But then the really interesting thing came in when we got to El Nino, and we learned about how the atmosphere and the oceans interact to change the way that heat is distributed about the planet and to generate weather and climate. Now, this is where the calculations go from that first one we did on the first day that basically any matric graduate could do on the back of an envelope to what well, we had to do, introduce the atmosphere and greenhouse effects union calculus, so that you're getting to undergraduate level, to now when the atmosphere and the ocean start to interact, if you want to do the numerical modeling, if you want to actually use equations to predict their behavior, you have gone beyond the human being's capacity to do maths, and you need computer models. And we started with a very simple model, right? And now we've got to the point where we need global climate computer models, we need to have a little bit of a sidestep from the main story to just think about what models are and what they do. So the next talk is introduction to modeling, and that introduces us basically to the different types of models, numerical models, where you solve equations. That works for everything from our calculated temperature to calculating the temperature with the calculus to the global climate models. Global climate models ultimately solve equations, simple Newton's maths. The second type of models Statistical models. Once we get to later on in the course, we'll actually have to start adding in life. And life is far too complex. I can't write an equation to um, decide what Zanelli is going to do next. I have no idea. She might just sit there, she might jump off the chair and take her clothes off. We have no idea. <laughs> I can't predict that with a, a numerical model. What we can start to use is what's called statistical models. They look at what's happened before and what happens on bulk properties and say what's likely to happen. So I can use a statistical model to say that everybody here is likely to remain sat in their seat and very unlikely to jump up and throw their clothes off. No, there's no equations behind that. What I'm using is statistics, what normally happens. So we do that with biology. When we get towards the end of the course, we'll need to use something called conceptual models. Anyone can think, anyone know an example of a conceptual model? For example, politics uses them. Communism is a conceptual model or socialism of how a society should be run. There's no statistics there 
there's no equations there, it's not numerical or statistical, there's just ideas about how something should work. And in fact, our hierarchy of models slide is really a conceptual model, right? It's a list of ideas about how we can understand the different parts of the equation. The one last thing to say about models is that they're all by definition wrong. Models are a representation of reality. Each of those different types is a different way of representing reality. If a model was 100% correct, it would be reality, right? It would actually be just another Earth that we created exactly the same as the first. That doesn't mean that they're useless. In fact, I would say often the most wrong models are the most useful. Our simple model at the start was great because we learned something. We learned that distance from the sun can't be the only thing that's keeping the planet habitable. Global climate models, I would argue, are somewhat less useful than that because they make predictions, but nobody understands all the equations that go into them. So do we trust those predictions? How do we know that we don't understand the assumptions going in? There are now whole research teams that are building models to try and understand the global climate models because no one understands them. So the point is, models are all wrong to different degrees, but they have different usefulness. Very wrong, simple models can tell us stuff. Very complicated, less wrong models can make predictions, but how certain are we of them? Okay, hand over to the chair. She's gone. Why, why is the chair there? Madam Chair. Where's the chair? Okay, okay. <laughs> let's check it's back on stage. Okay, now we are going to give us a talk on origins of life, uh, which is Mr. S. Ndaja and Ms. Z. Makosafaya. Makosafana. Yes, yes. Is this? Okay. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Um, good morning to you all. I think it's good morning. Uh, my name is Bonin Sum Jaja, and uh, my beautiful partner on the side is Sasekuma And then, uh, since we all know that uh, we've all gone through the Hipsical Planet model, which uh, at this moment has been uh, mostly physical. Uh, we introduced um, the, the atmosphere, the oceans, the air, and uh, all the, the, the other physical attributes that make the planet Earth habitable. However, before we go, uh, with all of that, we have been discussing why the planet Earth is habitable for life, but there has been no life in the entire model. So, in our talk, we're going to be introducing you to life and how it arose in uh, the planet Earth. So uh, the, three, uh, the, the, the overview or the key point that we're going to be uh, discussing will be uh, the, the, the origins of the Earth itself, just so we can take you back to when, when the Earth began and how old it is. And then from there, we'll take you through um, when the life itself originated. And then from there, we'll go through the evolution of life from the cell, from the chemical evolution to the biological evolution of life. Um, just to begin, I'll just give you a, a brief quote by uh, Ernest Bert, uh, who was in 1987. Uh, he says that life is improbable and it may be unique to its planet, but nevertheless, it did begin, and it is thus our task to discover how the miracle happened. So this this quote just uh, brings to life the, the, the reason of us being here and talking to you about the origin of life. So I'm sure all of you would want to know where it all started where everything began and how did we become to be who we are today. So that is just uh, the basics of what we're going to be doing. So then uh, just to uh, introduce you to the whole concepts of origins and uh, life itself, we're going to start by discussing the term origins itself. Uh, if, if you want to give a definition of what origins are, you are not going to be able to give an answer that is straightforward and uh, you're not going to get a straightforward or a, a, a a scientific answer that is a, like a law that states that life the origins are this and this and this and this. Because at the moment, no one knows where humans came from, which is the origin of human. We have evidence, but we don't know for sure. And we don't, also, we don't know where life itself came from, but we have theories that try to explain that. So that is just the introduction for you to be able to understand that at this moment, we're not going to be giving you laws, we're going to be giving you theories of the origin of life. So uh, with that context in mind, we, there is something called there are, uh, um, sorry, there are creation myths that are there that explain that try to explain where life came from. Those are more of the religion, religious 
treatments that explain life, which I will not go big into since they are not scientific and this is going to be a scientific talk. But it is something that uh, brings about debate when you compare science, uh, scientific talks, and creating creation myths. So then um, to begin, we're going to be starting with explaining what life is. So that also does not have a definition. Uh, I will not give you a definition of life as to life is this and this. However, I will try and uh, break it down to giving you the components that make life, that makes everything living. So the two fundamental properties uh, of life include the ability of a molecule or of something to facilitate chemical reactions in order to be able to um, facilitate um, cellular activity in, in, in a particular molecule. And another fundamental property is the fact that it should, uh, and that molecule should be also be able to pass on genetic information from one cell to the next. So that those are basically the two fundamental properties that make something living. And then to start off, uh, we're going to be going to the, the, the first key point, which is the origin of the Earth itself, uh, in order for us to be able to be able to put everything into context. The Earth, the concept that explains the origin of the Earth is the Big Bang Theory. So in, in a nutshell, the Big Bang Theory is one of the leading theories that explain um, the, uh, the, 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 how the universe began. Uh, and uh, in its simplest, it is just, uh, it talks about the universe as we know, it's starting with a small similarity, then inflating over the next 14, year, 14 billion years um, to the cosmos that we know today. So the evidence of it all has been put into, it is said that uh, the evidence of uh, the Big Bang Theory happening is the, the, the cosmic, um, sorry about that, the cosmic microwave, um, uh, the, 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 sorry. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's the cosmic microwave background, so that's not there, and you know, time to give you wrong information. Uh, so that's, uh, that is basically what um, the, the, the evidence is, which was detected by, by chance by uh, some scientists who were doing uh, their own uh, explorations of microwaves in the atmosphere, and that they ended up uh, ex uh, getting the, 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 the background of the Big Bang Theory. So then there is not the field that I'm going to be taking you through. Carl already did that in the beginning. So let's just go straight into how this fits in into what we're going to be doing here. So the Big Bang Theory occurred 14 billion years ago, yes, and uh, the planets and the Earth, they formed approximately um, 1 billion years after the Big Bang happened. Because uh, as we know, the Big Bang was quite a fast process. It took millions to create something like crossover electrons and neutrons and things like that. So it's not something that took billions and billions of years to just I have everything. So from there, we know that the, the Earth itself was created about 4.5 billion years, which is evident in the oldest fossils that were found in South Africa and Australia. And we also have the, the evidence, which is also there, is the evidence of stromatolites, which we found we also find in, in, in South Africa as well as Australia as well. So stromatolites are basically the uh, the the layer rock, which is a solid structure created by single cell microbes called cyanobacteria, green, blue, green algae, if you look at that. Uh, and these are found in South Africa, as we might know, some of you might know, in uh, quite a little bit by. So that is one of the things that makes South Africa a special place. So moving forward, I would like to introduce you to the theories that are there that try and explain life, which is the extraterrestrial theory, which is the theory that says life began out of space and was brought to Earth through meteorites or comets. And then there's also the terrestrial origins of life, which explain which are basically the RNA world, hydrothermal vent theory, which also includes in it the primordial soup theory, which uh, we're going to be discussing. And then you also have spontaneous generation. Uh, as you can see, it is written that it was disproved, basically because spontaneous generation uh, creation theory, it, it, it states that things occur spontaneously out of non-organic uh, matter, like uh, it said that maggots uh, originated from rotting flesh. And we all know that maggots do not originate from rotting flesh, it's flies that land on rotting flesh, leave eggs, and maggots occur. So that's basically why 
the spontaneous generation theory was before. And I'm going forward to the actual uh, terrestrial theory, the first evidence that was ever created of something like amino acids was done by Stanley Miller in uh, the miller urey experiment, uh, which is most famous, I'm uh, sure most of you might know it. Uh, in his experiments, he tried to uh, emulate the uh, conditions of um, the uh, primitive atmosphere, which is he created this apparatus, which had um, in the yellow part, you get primitive gases such as your methanes, your hydrogens, and um, your nitrogens, which were gases that were known to be there at the time. And you also have, we also added the uh, electric, electricity, electric current to try and uh, emulate the lightning of uh, the primitive atmosphere. And then you have uh, the heated oceans, which are known to be the oceans that were warm at the time, which also add water vapor to the four apparatus. And then after some time, he discovered that amino acids did arise from his experiments. And then that was more or less a breakthrough into trying to explain how that originated through um, being able to create amino acids from gases that were there. And uh, that, 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 that then tried to prove the theory of apogenesis or the terrestrial origins of life. But however, then from there till now, they have been trying to try and create more complex molecules, but even then, no one has been able to create something that can um, so that, that can pass on genetic information or that can uh, facilitate uh, chemical reactions, which is life. So moving forward from that, we have this theory, which is the hydrothermal vent model, which has also been proposed. The hydrothermal vent, hydrothermal vent is, you have probably two of them, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there is the white smoker and uh, the black smoker. It's like it's a <laughs> okay. That came up wrong. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it's, it's, it's two types of vents that emit different types of gases. Uh, the black smoker is one that we're going to be focusing on, which is um, more or less it's water that it's coming from below the ground, which has been heated by magma from below the ground. It's, it's usually in areas where you have. Uh, divergence, if I'm not mistaken, in regions. So you have this water that spouts out that reacts with um, the, this side of the, the, the rock or the um, ocean, oceanic crust to gather chemicals and then spout it out to the actual ocean. And, then, and those chemicals are rich in sulfide, if I'm not mistaken. So that sulfide creates uh, something like uh, mono, monomers, which are single cell uh, organisms or molecules that creates this soup, uh, which is called the primordial soup. It is a soup in a way because it's thick and it looks like a soup. So <laughs> it's the primordial soup that is believed to have been the source for the origins of life, because from the small cell, we do know that evolution does allow for, to, for life to go from small cells to bigger cells and create more and more complex cells. So there is another theory that is there, um, which is the thermal bench model or theory. And uh, to take you through the next line of theories will be my colleague, who will take you through the RNA world and transphemia and then break it down for you to better understand. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I will try as much as I can to be as fast as I can, but seemingly the time is very much against us. But uh, okay, the RNA world, uh, basically, um, it, uh, it's a, the RNA itself, it's a self-replicating molecule. Right, which contains the genetic information. Now, according to this theory, it says um, life descended from the RNA world, the, the, the life descended from the RNA world. And then it says that the RNA actually stored the genetic information and catalyzed the chemical reaction. The whole thing is explained with, uh, in this step. And if you look at step one, it says that RNA itself, it uh, actually arose from an inorganic, uh, inorganic, so from inorganic sources. And then it uh, could replicate itself, and then um, that way producing the, the, the okay, RNA would catalyze the protein synthesis, right? And then um, the, there would be a formation of membrane, and then there would be changes in the internal chemistry. And then if you look at step five, there is uh, a DNA. It says that the RNA would code both the protein as well as the RNA. 
and then the DNA then later became the master template, meaning that the DNA was the one that was responsible for 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 for, for like creating those amino acids to 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 to, to make that certain protein that is needed. Uh, and then uh, the proteins will recognize the cellular activity, which is where um, the, the, the cells actually began. And then from there on, uh, uh, organisms actually form. But then with this theory, you find that it's a little bit confusing at some point, because um, it says, it uh, explains that the, the, the protein is actually needed. That the protein, in order for protein to form, a DNA is needed. At the same time, uh, DNA also needs the protein that uh, can be referred to as a, as a, as a, as a primordial conundrum. That's a problem, primordial conundrum. How can the, the DNA form if it needs the protein? And how can the protein form if it needs the, gen, the DNA? It's more like the um, chicken and egg scenario. Which one, which one like, uh, is first than the other? But then this theory, uh, it's one of the most important theories because it tries to explain how that actually happened. Okay, um, and then let's go to, okay, yeah, um, there, is a, there is an evidence that life could also have evolved somewhere else out there in the space, not on the Earth itself. Now, this is explained by this theory, panspermia, it uh, basically, basically means that there was seed everywhere after the Big Bang and then the formation of the planet and everything. There was um, like life was out there, the microbes, they were out there like in the universe all over. But then it was only the app that had the, the, the ability to have a life. So um, the evidence, it says that, um, okay, okay, the evidence says that um, life, since it existed throughout the universe, it was actually taken by the meteorite, the cosmic dust, into the app, where it fell to the, 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 the Antarctic, Antarctica region. Yes. If you look at this picture right here, it's basically a meteorite that is carrying this um, bacteria carrying it to the earth itself. So this is how it actually happened. I believe that those small spots out there, it's either meteorites or else cosmic dust that carried this life out from the space to the earth. And then the evidence um, was also received from NASA. NASA also um, supports the theory. They said that uh, there have been some rocks that have been found on the Earth, which actually belong to Mars. So those rocks, they might have carried life. If you look at this picture here, there's this black rocks, rocks like something stuck here. Um, they say that it's basically, a, a, it was a fossil of a bacteria that they believe that it came from Mars and then when it came to the Earth, uh, it actually uh, started the whole process. And then another evidence of transphemia, uh, they say that the, 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 the bacteria is able to, to, to survive harsh environments. In other words, it would be, it, 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 it supports the theory, in that, the theory in that it is possible that um, the, 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 the bacteria could like um, originate somewhere else and then it would be carried down to it. Okay, and then we have these four theories that we have just discussed about. We have the RNA world, the hypothermal vent, the pathogenesis, and then the One would ask himself which one is which, which one is best. But um, uh, the one that is most widely accepted is the RNA world because it, uh, it explains the, 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 it explains um, the, 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 the speed of where the, the DNA, how come the DNA uh, evolved. The DNA originated first before the, 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 the protein, whereas the DNA it also needs the, 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 the protein in order to, to replicate itself. So this is basically the most uh, widely accepted theory. It was actually um, it was it was made to to, 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 to like to like deal with the with the with the promoter conundrum. And then this is how everything happened on the primitive, like like how life really the, the steps. There was a primitive atmosphere which contained those gases, as you see there, and then there were small and medium-sized molecules, which uh, later became large uh, molecules, which uh, the proteins, nucleic acid, polysaccharide, and then they became protons as time went by. After protons, they became prokaryotes, and then from prokaryotes, there was a formation of the eukaryotes, and then from there, there was um, multicellular organisms. And then uh, for the summary, we have uh, covered everything that was the part of the, 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 uh, the key point that we're supposed to cover. 
We have um, explained the age of the Earth, as you see in this diagram, it actually explains everything. And then we explain both theories, the scientific as well as the non-scientific, which is actually that myth that there was supernatural power that actually brought life into the Earth. And then we showed that the evidence is found on the stromatolites, which of course also exist in this uh, country, uh, in the Eastern Cape of Polynesia. And then we took you through to the evolution part of it. Yeah, thank you. So I'll just take three hands for feedback because we're running out of time here. Thank you for all of this presentation. Yes, Peter. Okay. Okay, by three minutes. Yeah. So, Peter. Thank you. Great, great presentation. I love the energy and very affordable and very clear. And it's a nice story and it's exciting that we really.
I mean, origins of life. So now that we know that life originated from the oceans, which composes of water, why don't we just take a ride together and see what this water is? Um, amazing water. Okay, here's an outline. Um, the amazing ones of water, we're going to be talking about what water is, uh, phases of water, the water cycle, the properties of water, molecular structure of water, how does water make Earth habitable, and what makes South Africa so special. And then I'll conclude. All right, let's look at water. Something water is life. Something water is purity. To some, water is a symbol of peace, symbol of love. But let's look at the scientific definition of what water is. Water is a transparent fluid which forms uh, almost three quarters of the part of the world. It forms part of the str uh, uh, streams, lakes, and oceans. And the appearance of water, it appears clear, like it's, it, it's colorless, it's odorless, and it's tasteless. Sometimes it, it appears blue in large water masses. And the boiling uh, at 100 degrees Celsius, water boils and changes space. At zero degrees Celsius, water melts. Okay, water is the only substance that naturally occurs in three phases. And the kinetic theory can explain this very well. It says uh, in the kinetic theory of matter, all uh, uh, states that all matter is made of small particles that are in random motion and that have space between them. This means that no, no matter what phase is, isn't it? It is made uh, of separate moving particles. So in solid state, water, I mean, the, the particles are closely packed together. And in, in gaseous phase, they are further apart. And in liquid, just, they're just in the middle. Yeah, they're not far apart. They're not closely packed. So this is how water is. Everything is as solid as gas and liquid. All right. Um, the fact that what appears as three, I mean, naturally appears as in three phases makes it possible for the water cycle to occur is because of, I mean, it changes, it, 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 it makes, I mean, sorry, it makes it possible for heat to be exchanged uh, between the oceans and the atmosphere. And that's where our water cycle gets in. In the water cycle, we have, um, who can tell me where the water cycle starts? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it starts anyway. Right, thank you. So we can start from the oceans. The water from the ocean. <laughs> okay, yeah. Water starts in the oceans, and then this liquid water can evaporate and, and changes. I mean, when the, when, when the sun hits the oceans, the water evaporates, and then it goes to the atmosphere. In, uh, um, as vapor, and then when it gets in the atmosphere, the the water droplets um, come together and form a cloud. This cloud will then condense, and then this cloud will then bring rain in the atmosphere. I mean, on Earth as precipitation, and when water comes back on Earth as precipitation, it goes to all the I mean, it grows, it goes into the streams, and then back to the ocean. So this makes it possible. For water to remain fresh, it, this cycle makes sure that the water remains fresh. The water is usable. It's yeah, it's warm. <laughs> so okay, let's look at the properties of water. Um, one of the properties of water that makes it so special, one fundamental property, is that the water is the is the hydrogen. I mean, is the hydrogen bond. Water is a polar molecule. It's oxygen bonded to two hydrogen molecules. And then at the ends, there, there are negative, uh, it's negative, there's a positive end. Hydrogen has positive ends. 
and then oxygen has a negative end. And the fact that the water, I mean, the water molecule is not symmetrical makes it a polar molecule. And then the other thing is that it's angular. The shape is angular. It's not symmetrical, and that make it, makes it polar. Okay, let's look at the structure, the chemical structure of water. Here is a water molecule. These water molecules are bonded together to form, uh, to form water. These water, water molecules are bonded together by um, with hydrogen bonds. These bonds are able to break and form at any time. So, yeah, this is one of the properties that make water so special. These other properties that come after is because of the water. I mean, the, 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 the hydrogen bonds that are in between water molecules. So these are the extraordinary, uh, these are the extraordinary uh, properties come as a result of the hydrogen bonding in between water molecules. So how does the water make our planet as habitable? Okay, water has very high specific heat. It allows water, allows, okay, the specific heat, the high specific heat allows water to moderate the Earth's climate. The fact that it's never too hot, it's never too cold, water is able to moderate that. And water serves as a large heat sink, which is responsible for stable marine climate. That's why the speech says, I'm going to say, I love the significance of water. So, <laughs> another thing that makes water so special. All right, thank you. I think that makes uh, water so special and makes our habitable planet still maintains the thing of being habitable is that, is that water is a universal solvent. It has high dissolving uh, ability. So just like in our bodies, we have high, uh, it's able to dissolve thing, things. Just like in our bodies, we have oxygen, which needs to be dissolved. And what is responsible in doing that, it dissolves the oxygen and then which is transported in our bodies and then goes to the brain. That's why we, I'm talking like this. It's because of water that dissolves the oxygen and the other molecules in my, in my body. Another thing is that uh, ice is less dense than water. So the fact that ice is less dense is able to float on water and water remains underneath and then yeah, still maintains life in the marine life, I mean, in the marine, yeah. Another thing that uh, make, that water has, that makes it possible for the planet Earth to be habitable, is the surface tension. The surface tension comes as a result of hydrogen bonds, like I mentioned earlier. The hydrogen bonds are for our uh, they are attached together, like they cannot separate. So, in uh, in this case, then they don't separate. So that makes it possible for surface. It has high surface tension. It has high surface tension, and it makes it possible for uh, for insects like this to to float on water. And some of them are able to to lay eggs on water. It's because of the high surface tension of water. And another one is adhesion or co cohesion. This is when um, this is when water molecules are uh, attached to other molecules, and then this makes it possible for the capillary action to occur in our in our plants. Water is is being able to be sucked up uh, without it being affected by the gravitational force. So, what's so special about water in South Africa? Well, South Africa has diverse water bodies surrounding it. We have the Indian Ocean, like she made, like Belinda mentioned in her presentation. We have the Indian Ocean here, and we have our, our Antarctic Ocean in the western side of, the, of South Africa. So South Africa is the only country that that is surrounded by two large water, I mean, different water masses. So that makes it so special, and yeah, she, that she explained the upwelling. Uh, I mean, the upwelling in the western part, and that the upwelling doesn't occur in the eastern part. And then yeah, like it's, uh, there's a lot of people who come to our country just for the for these water masses. Some do have the cold oceans, 
so they're not able to swim. They come to South Africa to swim in in the in the in the east, I mean, in the eastern part. So that makes South Africa <laughs> so special. South Africa doesn't only have uh, two large water I mean, body masses. It doesn't only have Indian on Atlantic Ocean only. It also have other water. I mean, other water bodies. We have perennial rivers like Limpopo River. Uh, What's special about this Limpopo River is that it forms border between South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Botswana, and it it flows throughout the year. That's why I call it Canary River. So yeah, another thing is that we had large dams, and this is one of the biggest I mean, dams in South Africa, the 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 Harid Dam. So in conclusion, what I, I would like to say, my three points. That I think that I important my talk. All the extraordinary properties of water come as a result of hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. If there were no hydrogen bonds, you wouldn't have I wouldn't have mentioned the, the these properties. They wouldn't be here. Another thing is that the abundance of I mean the abundance of liquid water make it possible for planet Earth to remain habitable. And another thing is that our country is so special because of these water masses that surround it, the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you, Othelia, for a wonderful talk. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, Peter. Solid is more spread out than the liquid because of hydrogen bonding. And the liquid. 
Yet in the solid, it's more spread out, it's less dense in the liquids because of hydrogen bonding. So normal substances go gas, liquid, solid. Water goes gas, solid, liquid. Liquid is the most dense. Oh. And that's one of the really special properties of it. That's why ice floats on water and not the other way around, like it could be with something else. Okay? And then lastly, if you come to the properties, I know you, you did make an entity, you said they all result from the hydrogen bonding. You didn't say why, so you couldn't the next one. Uh, right, high specific heat capacity. Why does it have a high specific heat capacity? Well, when you're adding heat to molecules, right, you're making them move around each other faster. If there's no hydrogen bonding, that's easy. If the molecules are stuck to each other, the hydrogen bonding, it's hard to make them move, so you have to add more energy. So it's the hydrogen bonding that makes the high specific heat capacity. You relate the chemical to the property. You go to the next one. The ice melting on water or universal solvent is because of the charge that I put in it, but possibly in the negative it can dissolve everything. It goes back to the structure. The ice melting on water, as we just said, is because uh, ice is less dense because hydrogen bonds form big open rings. The next one uh, surface tension. Why can't another substance go into water? Because it has to break the hydrogen bond, it has to split them up because of the hydrogen bonding. Why does water get pulled up trees? Well, because one molecule of water pulls the next one up. Why is it from the next one up? I mean the hydrogen bond. Of the hydrogen bond. So you see what I mean by relating it each time. You have to explain why it arises from the property. And then the big one, you're still missing the biggest one, but it's a greenhouse gas. That's the most important thing. That's the one thing of water that makes the planet habitable. It's a greenhouse gas, so that's got to go in. That all having been said, I'm being really hypocritical because is my talk, so I know it's better than any other talk, and you still did a beautiful job of presenting it. Much better than 9 out of 10, amazing work. Um, Aaron? Uh, Madam Chair? I'm sorry. I'm just joking. A bit louder, please. Oh, sorry, you've had... Right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Right, cool, guys. We're <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Carl Palmer with. Huh? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So we started off with our, our physical model, right? And then we've got the oceans and the atmosphere and how they interact. And now we started to bring out something new and interesting. We have origins of life. So just we went from a simple physical model where there's no biological stuff to thinking about how life arose billions of years ago, single-celled organisms arose, right? What's fascinating, and we found out just now, that water turns out to be the key thing in determining whether life can exist. What's fascinating now, and it's one of the big revelations in the course for me, is it turns out that the planet wouldn't be habitable without life itself. Life itself is actually needed to make the planet habitable, which is a bit of a mad catch-22. One of the primary ways and the most obvious ways in which that happens is in terms of plants. Plants provide for us the oxygen that we breathe, right? We all know George makes the analogy that if we shut off this room now uh, and closed all the doors and sealed and stopped anything from getting in, what would happen? What would happen if we close off all the exits and entrances, not a molecule of anything can get in and out? We die, right? Why? We suffocate. But how could we prevent that? Very simple way. Sorry? Letting molecules in, but let's say that we can't, we're isolated, what could we do? Bring some plants in here. That's the, the really simple equation, right? We, we need oxygen in order to survive. 
They need carbon dioxide. It's a symbiotic relationship between us and the plants. They're the ones that produce the oxygen. So now we've brought life into the model. We need to think about photosynthesis, how it works, how it provides. It, firstly, it provides oxygen for us, but it also provides food, right? But if, fine, we brought some plants in, we wouldn't die of, uh, of um, suffocation, but we'd soon die of hunger. We need the food that plants produce. And that's because plants are the only organisms, virtually, on Earth that are able to use the sun's light to make food. And they provide food and oxygen for everything on Earth. And they do it through this thing called photosynthesis. It takes carbon from the air, it fixes it, it releases oxygen in the process. It's fixed in the form of carbohydrates. That's what we eat. All of life on Earth, therefore, depends on it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. We have Carl. You're supposed to be here. I didn't tell you to go. <laughs> okay, sit back, guys. <laughs> sit back. Yes, Cassandra? <laughs> With no slides. <laughs> <laughs> so much power. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, up next, we have uh, are you how many offended? Yes, I love this guy. Vaseline, yeah. Do you guys agree? Yeah. Are you sleepy? Yeah. Vaseline, please. Oh, wow. 
She's moving to the University of Free State this year. <laughs> uh, we'll be sharing our talk about my diversity with you today. Um, our talk falls on uh, the fifth stage of the hierarchy of models used by the Habitable Planet Workshop. Uh, this is our content. So we'll be talking to you about what is biodiversity, uh, food webs and their importance, the importance of biodiversity, threats to biodiversity, conservation of biodiversity, and what makes South Africa special biodiversity wise. So, what is biodiversity? Let's just take the word and split it into two. Bio means life, diversity means variety. So, basically, biodiversity is the variety of life on Earth at all its, at all its levels, from genes to ecosystems, and the ecological and evolutionary processes that sustain it. It is not only intrusive of endangered, threatened, or protected species, but also microorganisms to wild flora and fauna, but besides the human species. It is the most important part of the dynamic natural ecosystem. For example, um, I can talk a little about uh, cyanobacteria, as one of uh, our panelists mentioned it. Uh, cyanobacteria was responsible for the conversion of our anaerobic atmosphere into an aerobic one. That conversion made sure that we know diversity as it is today, biodiversity as it is today, because it, um, it created an atmosphere that could foster life that would be dependent on oxygen. Uh, we have three major levels of biological, di biodiversity, uh, biological diversity. Uh, we have genetic species and ecosystem di diversity. So what is genetic uh, diversity? Genetic diversity is the variation between individuals of a species. Uh, for example, us, we want species, but what makes us different? Uh, we have different eye color, different body sizes, and different hair colors. And then we move along to species diversity, which is the variety of uh, different living things, such as us, fish, my cat, Bob, and my dog, Kelly. <laughs> I don't have to. <laughs> and ecosystem diversity on the other side is the variety of environments due to the interactions of the non-living and living things. Such as um, a good example would be the difference between our terrestrial and our uh, our terrestrial and our aquatic ecosystem. This talk would not really be a great talk if I didn't mention food webs and their importance. So, what are food webs? Food webs are strings of superimposing um, food chains that are formed by the different levels of uh, uh, the different levels of the tropic pyramid. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is our tropic pyramid. Uh, we have different <laughs> levels on the tropic. We have our producers, our primary consumers, our secondary consumers, and our tertiary consumers. Energy transfer in this pyramid. Uh, this is very tricky. Uh, only 10% of the energy from each trophic level is transferred to the next. So for us, oh, our plants get their energy from the sun, and our primary consumers, maybe let's say um, our cattle, get theirs from the plants. We only get 10% get 10 of the initial energy as humans. If maybe you know, if maybe like steak, like me, yes, you're only getting 10% of the energy. 
uh, the stability of our ecosystems is dependent on the interactivity and the interconnectivity of organisms through food webs and their respective life processes. The more complex the food web, the more stable the ecosystem, and the more habitable the planet is because we have all these interconnections that make sure that we get what we need, the services that we need from the ecosystems. As you can see from this food web, any addition or removal of the species would be very detrimental. It would cause a, a very detrimental ripple effect. For example, if we remove this lizard from this food chain or this food web, then our rental plate will struggle because they won't have their preferred food, which is this lizard. The distribution and the numbers of the rental snake will actually decrease, which is bad. <laughs> it's very bad for us because we need to sustain what we have and conserve what we have so that we continue to have this habitable planet. Moving right along, why do we need biodiversity? Uh, biodiversity can never be valued in monetary terms. It is actually more precious than gold, unless we have gold diggers, no offense. <laughs> um, it provides us with ecosystem services, um, provisioning services, uh, supporting services, cultural services, and regulating services. These services are essential for our lives because they provide us with our basic needs such as food, drinking water, shelter, and medicines. It does not only provide us with our basic needs, but also sustains or regulates the air for us. Uh, we have um, an example of that would be how uh, wetlands actually purify our water so we have drinking water and how estuaries act as natural nurseries for our fish which we need, which we need for the nutrition. You need omega-3 and 6 to stay clever and need more of those. And <laughs> uh, other than that, it is, uh, biodiversity is very important because it acts as um, an indicator of our um, environmental health. For example, um, in a grassland, if you're missing a highly palatable species like the middle triandra, you would know that that grassland is very really disturbed, and you need to take steps to preserve it so you bring it to its natural state, because that is good. It, it is actually great for us to conserve our biomes and sustain them. Not only that, it also uh, provides us with cultural richness and spiritual heaven, mostly for traditional healers and, and hippies. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, other than that, uh, economic achievement is uh, a great benefit of, of, of biodiversity. Those who attended the 17th uh, uh, Habitable Planet Workshop will know when we went to Ismailiso Wetland Park, it is not privately owned to say, because uh, it belongs to the government the city, and actually the people. People benefit from the tourism around that area. That is a great thing. We need more of that. We need to use our biodiversity so that it benefits us, but we do not kill it. Uh, and that is it for me. I will pass this talk over to my partner, Sebo, who will talk more on uh, threats to biodiversity, as well as how we can conserve biodiversity and what makes South Africa special biodiversity-wise. Thank you. Thank you, Tando. Well, looking at what makes um, our diversity in our country so special, we need to understand the threats that are threatening this biodiversity that we have. And these can um, come as a result of the activities that human population engage in. And this actually puts us at a disadvantage because this biodiversity is actually a supportive system. The, the, these threats can come in the form of agriculture. And by agriculture, we're looking at how there is a need to clear the natural uh, state of the natural vegetation in these areas to make a way for crop, excuse me, to make way for cropping so that we can supply the demand that is that is with that comes with population growth, which is um, a chain a reaction to urbanization, which is also stated as a negative effect. We also have the problem of alien invasive species. We are, we are talking about species that are able to survive in really extreme conditions, which endemic species do not have the adaptation for. They end up um, overpowering these endemic species. And we come down to the most threatened uh, biomes that we have. We have three of them, which is the grassland, 
the, the fin was biome and the Indian coastal bat. On the screen here, we have, we have a map from the, the United Nations um, Environmental Program. They, they map the areas that are most threatened by uh, the, the coastal areas that are threatened by um, using diversity. You will see that the red line that comes across South Africa is the most altered because of the, the, flavor, the favorable conditions of the Indian Ocean as we have the Indian coastal belt. And these are mostly uh, populated by resorts and hotels, which is um, a negative effect on the biodiversity as well. And when the need, there is a need to conserve this biodiversity that we have. And the government has, let me rephrase that, the legislation of South Africa, within it there is a, na a National Environmental Management Act 107 of 1993, which is um, re-regulated re every year. And the ones that are, are most uh, related to biodiversity are NIMBA, which is the Nas National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act, and the NIMPA, which is the National Environmental Management Protected Areas Act. And under these, you are looking at how the Biodiversity Act and the, the it is looking at how the biodiversity in all the areas, it's not looking specifically at certain areas like the Protected Areas Act, it is looking at how the, the biodiversity can be used in a more sustainable manner. And that was that resulted in the formation of uh, institutes like the South African National Biodiversity Institute. And under the South African National Biodiversity Institute, it came to steward the stewardship program. The stewardship programs are basically people within a community or provincial, as we have put on the slide, that actually adopt an area that you will look after, make sure that the ecosystems in that area are not over um, over exploited, as there is a use for everything in our biodiversity. And last, what makes South Africa special? And there comes the, the famous uh, figure of the biome in South Africa, which is the, the, in the Cape, the Western part where we are. We have the entire uh, Cape Rose Kingdom, which makes South Africa special immediately. And the, the, these different biomes show that different areas in our country experience different um, uh, climatic conditions, with, which has an impact on the biodiversity. And that's the Mediterranean climate in the Cape region. As I've said, we have the, the entire thing loss, which is a result of the Mediterranean climate. And we have the vine lands and we have all the corn and so on. And the Cape First Kingdom, which is the King Pro, the Protea, where we also get the King Protea. It's a shrubby, but um, this whole ecosystem is maintained by fires and then the dragonfly. This this feeds back onto what my partner has spoken about the ecosystem services. You have your cultural for leisure, hiking. We have the bearded eagle, and here you can see how there are there are, there are two different biomes existing. We have the grasslands. And we have the, the mountain forest up there. This is the, the endangered parrot, which Tandoretu works on. Yeah, the okay, parrot. And here we have the Arctos ferritis barbatinus, which is another form of the cyanobacteria, which was found in Barbatin. That's the actual rock that we have there, and that's the physical location. And in closing, we'd like to, we'd like to have a summary. We have explained what biodiversity is, the life forms, the ecosystems, the food webs, and how those interlink. And we've come to how biodiversity is a support structure to sustain life on Earth. And we've highlighted the different uh, things that make South Africa so special. And lastly, we have shown you the pretty pictures of 
the different ecosystems, the different biomes that we have in South Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Suebo. Thank you, Sunday, for a wonderful presentation. So I'll take three hands for first back. Uh, we have Mr. Malawozi. Who else? Hassan, Lassera. Okay, can you start with your name? Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, um, I'm, I'm glad you followed some of the uh, recommendations given this study. Um, and uh, the other thing that uh, is also advisable is um, when you are defining some scientific projects, avoid to also put other scientific projects. Because uh, when you're talking about people, you need to do something like food chain. So, you know, that's when you ask about. So, and uh, the same applies when you were discussing about the uh, tropic pyramid, you just jump into the uh, tropic pyramid. Um, and um, I would also, um, if possible, um, we, we can also explore the, the, the National Environmental Analytics Fund of 2004. Um, and um, I thought maybe we were going to also touch base on the relationship to climate change and biodiversity. Because we need to enhance the biodiversity. But I think we have a lot of work to do. I think we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Masala. Thanks. I think it was a great presentation. You guys project your voices. Well, and uh, we can take high contact with the group that we can do this work. And uh, we can cover some of the important points, uh, except I thought that we didn't bring out uh, how our ethnic space and public. And also, I thought that you know, uh, it's a very important topic. And one of the challenges about it, I think we realize. These natural resources do actually have economic value, and you said that it can be translated to economic value, and that is one of the challenges. It can be true, and that is one of the ways in which we can overcome some of the challenges. Thank you, Bella. Uh, so, um, I think that's really good. Thank you. The one with the lizard and the snake. The map. The map. Okay. Anybody else? I right, thank you guys for the presentation. We're going to buy Joe Chemical Cycles with Anna and Shonda. Um, 
a pleasant afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Shota Mangwanya. And I'm Anna Okinilu uh, Today we're going to be talking about body biochemical cycles. Um, firstly, I'll start by giving an overview of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to start by telling you what uh, biochemical cycles are. And uh, we're going to explain how the elements move and the transfer of energy and nature within the cycle. And also, we're going to focus on the five main cycles. There are many biogeochemical cycles, but today we're going to focus on the main, the five main ones. That is the water cycle, nitrogen cycle, carbon cycle, uh, phosphorus cycle, and sulfur cycle. Um, uh, and then after that, we're going to show you how, why is it that it's important to study these cycles and why should we study biogeochemical cycles uh, in South Africa. Uh, this word biogeochemical cycle, biogeochemical, it can be split into three the biological, the geological, and the uh, chemical part. Bio, I think we all know that bio means life. Geological, it means um, the, um, the environmental part of it, the non living part of it, like it's in the environment, that is the, uh, the hydrosphere, the dossier, and the, the um, atmosphere. And then the chemical, it, uh, it just uh, it will just be showing how those elements move, like even the chemical reactions that are involved and, and everything. So biogeochemical, these are um, biogeochemical cycles. These are they show how the element uh, moves between the living part and the non-living part of this world. The elements that move within the biogeochemical cycles, they are controlled by the exchange pool, the reservoirs, and the community. The reservoirs, it's something that stores or keeps uh, the elements. So reservoirs, we have the rocks that keeps the minerals, the nutrients that we are going to explain, and soils that are also found in oceans, they have the nutrients. And then the, the exchange pool, it's it's the, the, in the atmosphere which helps in the circulations and the, the plants that helps in circulating, the, for example, carbon and exchanging it to, and, and producing oxygen in the air. And then the community it involves the biodiversity, things like producers, uh, decomposers, uh, which helps with the, the cycle. The processes that are involved uh, in, in, in biogeochemical cycles it's the physical processes, the biological processes, and human activities. The physical processes, for example, include uh, the, the, the sto storage of carbon dioxide in oceans, as, as oceans are, is, a, is a carbon sea. And then the biological processes, as I explained, or rather as Carl explained before, the, the, ex the, the intake of carbon, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and the production of oxygen which is through photosynthesis. And then through human activities, the combustion of fossil fuels, we, we, we take out carbon from the ground, maybe as coal or as, as gas or oil. And then when we combust that through oxidation, we produce uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And also through gold extraction, when we, we do mining activities, we expose rocks that uh, that would not react with the atmosphere if they were not exposed. So by exposing those rocks, we we increase the speed of the of the processes that causes exchange and movement of the, the nutrients. Energy is transferred from the sun into to the producers. So producers are the first things that absorb the most of the energy from the sun. That energy is transferred throughout this, the, the consumers, and then it comes back, it, uh, and then it, more energy comes from the sun, the cycle continues. But then the question is, where does the matter come from? So the producers, it doesn't show where the matters come from, but we, we keep on being there. Nothing is added, nothing is lost. Everything is conserved. So where does the matter come from? It comes from the 
from the atmosphere, the lithosphere, and the hydrosphere. These are the the reservoirs I explained before, and the yeah the reservoirs I explained before. The atmosphere is the, it's, it's the surrounding which is gaseous. It's it's compressed of uh, different gases, and the lithosphere it's the ground. It involves the rocks which have different minerals and gives of different nutrients. The hydrosphere it's water bodies, either lakes, oceans, or, or dams. Uh, they 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 help in the trans, uh, transportation of different minerals and elements. Uh, okay, um, we are now moving on to how this cycle will operate and how it will come about. Uh, I think as uh, in, in the uh, this cycle has already been talked about in the collector on uh, amazing water, but I'm just going to re-emphasize on it. As you can all see, it's left touch with the plant. The plants and the animals they take up they take up water from the lake and uh, from the groundwater also. And they use this water, and this water it goes back into the atmosphere um, through the process of evaporation and transpiration. And after that, the, the water condenses, and then after condensation, clouds are formed, and then there will be precipitation. It comes back to the ground. The other water will infect, infiltrate back into the groundwater, and then the other one will, will, will move by move to uh, the water body, that is the sea lake, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> on the on the carbon cycle, what happens on the carbon cycle is that uh, there is carbon dioxide in the air. So plants and plants they take that carbon dioxide and then they use it to, to they convert it into um, into and then they take it into the plant uh, through assimilation. So when they take this this carbon into the plant, the animals uh, come and then they eat that plant. And then animals get their carbon from the plants. And animals, they also release that carbon uh, through the process of respiration back into the atmosphere. And then when that carbon goes back into the atmosphere, um, it comes back. Uh, it can be taken also by the ocean. And it can also be taken uh, to fossil, um, fossil uh, fuels and fossil, uh, fossil stuff. And then from there, it can be used uh, uh, in the factories for the production of food. Uh, and the process of, uh, of, of um, combating will emit that the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and then on the nitrogen cycle, what happens is that nitrogen, as mentioned earlier in the previous talk, that nitrogen in the atmosphere is about 78%. And then what happens to that nitrogen is that it is split into the soils by, um, by living organisms like nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria. And this bacteria, what they do is that they fix this nitrogen into ammonia. This ammonia is taken up by plants. And when it's taken up by plants, the, the, uh, some animals like us human beings, we take that nitrogen from the plant. And then when we take that nitrogen from the plant, we die or and decompose. And then that nitrogen will come back to the soil. And it will be converted back to ammonia, uh, to ammonium, and ammonium will be uh, will be converted to to nitrate, and nitrate to uh, nit nitrite to nitrate, and then after the nitrate is uh, produced, it can either be denitrified back into the atmosphere, or it can be moved to rivers. When this nitrate is moved to rivers, as we all know that um, all life, uh, nitrogen is important for 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 the growth of for life, eh? and then when it goes into the um, into the uh, into the stream, it will cause uh, what we call uh, eutrophication. Eutrophication it is defined as um, as uh, when uh, the, the bloom of the of of life uh, of the what do you call this the life in the in the in the rivers when they receive uh, that nitrogen, they use it to produce more, and when they produce more uh, more plants in the rivers. There will be that phenomena that we call eutrophication. That is, uh, this light will, 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 when they die, they decompose. And when they decompose, they, uh, the oxygen in the, in the seas is used to, uh, for the decomposing by the microbes. Yeah, for now, we'll cover the sulfur cycle. Uh, I'll start here with the ocean. Uh, in the ocean, 
So what happens, we, we have rocks that are rich in sulfur. That sulfur will be it is broken down by bacteria, and then it becomes a diamethyl sulfide. This diamethyl sulfide will go into the atmosphere, and then it changes into sulfur dioxide. That sulfur dioxide can also be obtained from volcanic eruptions here. And then it can also be obtained from fossil fuels when they are combusted in factories. All of this from the ocean, from the factories, and from volcanoes, they're going to the atmosphere. And then when there's rain, that she explained with the water cycle, that sulfur dioxide will mix with the rain, and that, that rain comes down as sulfuric acid. That the, the plants will, 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 in, will take in the sulfuric acid, like it does with normal water, and then animals will eat the plants, and then when animals and the plants die, they will decompose. That acidic component is still in the plants and the animals that decompose. So we still have the acidic component in the soil. So that soil will be eroded by running water into the into the rivers. The same thing will happen again. The, the water will mix up with the sediments that were in the rivers. Those sediments might uh, form rocks and become uh, fossil fuels, or they may come here and then the sulfur will be decomposed by bacteria and then the cycles uh, continues. Then for the first for a cycle, I'll start here on this arrow. So we have rocks that are rich in phosphorus. Um, this rocks, for rocks to be worked on, they need to be uplifted tectonically. So these rocks that form in the oceans will first be uplifted. When they're uplifted, they'll be exposed to different kinds of processes. Processes like weathering and the, the acid, acid rain that I explained before, when it rains onto those rocks that are exposed, it, they, it can weather the rocks. So when, when, when phosphorus-rich phosphorus rocks are weathered, they become sediments or gravel, and then they, they are easy to be transported. This is what is happening here. That sulfuric acid or any water rain, it can erode the, water, the, the rocks that were exposed here. And then the, the gravel is now uh, eroded into the oceans or, or lakes. And then phosphorus is also used in agriculture. When we use that phosphorus, water is everywhere. When it runs off, when it runs, it takes it takes uh, with itself the phosphorus into the ocean or the any body of water. And then also here, when the animals eat the plants that were planted with with phosphorus-rich fertilizers, when they die, they decompose uh, through bacterial actions. And then leaching happens. The, those things that will decompose, they come back to this ocean or water body. The same thing will happen again, that the, those sediments will solidify, they become rocks again, and then they they get uplifted, exposed to, to weathering again. So now moving on to the importance of biogeochemicals. Uh, biogeochemicals, the important rule, they regulate elements necessary for life. They also incorporate the biotic and the abiotic aspects, and they sustain a continuous survival. Uh, as you can see, biogeochemicals are, are important in agriculture. They're the ones that facilitate, uh, you know, the nitrogen cycle, uh, as mentioned earlier. Uh, you cannot take, you can, nitrogen is needed by plants, but they cannot use nitrogen as N2, but they need it as NO3. And also, they also help us to clear up the environment. If there were no biogeochemicals, this was what uh, the environment was going to look like. They reduce those uh, those huge um, huge carcasses into simple elements that is carbon, oxygen, and so forth. Uh, earlier on, Kaus was speaking about photosynthesis, and he asked, "What will we need if we are suffocated in a room?" And he. Uh, he said plants so that they produce oxygen. I say we need everything that is in our planet, not just plants. If we have uh, a greater production of oxygen and less consumption, 
will combust in here and everyone will just burn. And then <laughs> if we have if we have greater combustion and less production of oxygen, uh, animals that depend on oxygen will die. So we need everything, we need water, we need the atmosphere in here to balance each and everything that we need for life. Um, South Africa is the best country to study uh, biogeochemical cycles because South Africa is depending on coal for, for their power production. And coal, when, when we burn coal, we produce carbon. We can easily study the carbon cycle because we have uh, production of carbon. This is in Pumana, it's one of the power stations that we have in South Africa. And we have a diverse geology in South Africa. We have different kinds of rocks which produce different kinds of minerals and nutrients. Hence, we can study their cycles and how they change through time. And uh, well, we have different kinds of mining activities, mining of phosphorus in uh, in, in Palabora in Limbobo. When, we, when they mine the phosphorus, they expose different kinds of rocks which were hidden. And then when rain comes, it forms a pond inside. And when the pond, it, when it becomes uh, bigger, it can uh, erode other rocks and, and the phosphorus can be transported to other areas. That cycle I was explaining what happened just like that. And with gold, different kinds of nutrients uh, and sulfur are exposed during mining of gold. And this uh, leads us to acid mine drainage, especially in, in the birds. Um, super group in Houting. And also we have uh, the diversity of fossil fuels which produce different kinds of carbon dioxide and uh, we can study the carbon cycles like that. We have different uh, 250 estuaries in South Africa. By that we can gain, the estuaries will help us to connect uh, the land with the oceans. So different kinds of pollutions from the from the land will be, will be easily transported by these estuaries into the ocean. That's why Belinda said we have uh, upwelling. There wouldn't be upwelling if we didn't have anything to bring the nutrients from the land into the ocean. And then we have uh, seven biomes in South Africa. Uh, the, the biomes, we have, when we have biomes, we have different biodiversity. We have different animals which use up different nutrients and produce different nutrients. So we have a lot of nutrients to study and study their cycles in just in South Africa. Um, this is the summary. We have time and not going to go through it. Hopefully, you and this is the summary of what we're talking about. That matter is conserved and distributed the biotic that is the living and the abiotic that is the uh, the non living part of the um, of the of the world. And this is done in a process that is called biogeochemical cycles. And these cycles, they are important. They also play an important role in climate. They also play an important role in, um, in photosynthesis and all those things. Um, conclusion, we can say life depends on, on constant supply of nutrients. Nutrients are like recycled through biogeochemical cycles. And, um, they are also a driver in the change in the age time system. And the effects, uh, the, the, if there's no uh, the type of biogeochemical, there will be no this in the If there's no biogeochemical cycle, there will be no this uh, element that is carbon, nitrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and uh, sulfur, no cycling, no life, and you'll be all dead. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys for a wonderful presentation. And do we have any feedbacks? Uh, we have our brother, the. Could you tell me your name? Patience. All right, patience. And then we have Megan here. Another hand? Okay, Vaseline. <laughs> we have Carl. All right, cool. Who's got the patience? Thank you. 
in my head is standardized. So the, the the greenhouse effect diagram or the food web diagram that we all use is the same one. So when we do come back to it, the students can see that we're coming back to something we've done before because it's the same figure. So it might be something nice for everyone to think about. It might be like, oh, and the poor dead animals. Like the slides are just full of dead animals. It's another slide with dead animals. <laughs>